You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today, we are looking in this mini episode at players who are outperforming their expectations and could be candidates to be sold high in a trade. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed, and we will start with Freddie Van Vliet in Toronto. Over the last two weeks, Van Vliet is the 11th ranked player. That, of course, is insanely high. Over the course of the season, he is ranked 23rd. Really, really good and exceeding all expectations. I had him as a must-draft guy, a guy around the top 80, I believe, in the preseason, but nowhere near this level of production. Over those last six games, he's averaging 23 points in 38 minutes, but he's doing it on 47% shooting, including 53% from two-point range. Now, this is a bloke that hasn't even sniffed 45% from two-point range before. He's at just 42% over the course of the season. So it is safe to say there is an element of hot streak shooting, plus an element of increased usage, 25% usage over this time with Lowry out, and all those things adding up to me. Now, I'm not looking at selling him for a top 80 guy. I think he's going to be a top 40 guy at worst the rest of this season, but he is 11th over the last two weeks. So this is a really prolonged, uh, well, not even that prolonged, it's a nice short-term bump in his production. And if you can swing that for a guy who might be struggling a little bit, maybe it's a Damian Lillard. You you entertain a a trade along those lines. I've seen people are frustrated with what Bradley Beal is doing. Maybe you could look at that. Beal's the 20th ranked player over the course of the season. So maybe there's something to swing there. Maybe it's Big Chungus, Nikola Jokic that you could look at in that sort of a deal. But... Van Vliet's production at the moment has an element of unsustainability to it. The next guy we talk about is another point guard, and that is the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray of the Denver Nuggets. Over the last two weeks, he is the 15th ranked player, averaging just 19 points per game, but he's giving us five assists. That's okay. Look, that's higher than what he has been doing all season, but it's not far off. He's hitting 2.7 triples, which would be a career high. His best mark in a season is two a game. Why is he doing that? Well, 38% shooting is not outrageous, so where's that coming from? There's an increase in three-point attempts, but why is he so high, Josh? Well, he hasn't missed a free throw in the last six games. He's also averaging 2.7 steals. This is a bloke that last season averaged 0.9 steals. So to look at him and think that he's even going to keep up the rate that he's going this year is at 1.6 steals. There's nothing in his career that would put him near that. His three NBA seasons prior, 0.6 1.0 and 0.9 steals. Now, if he could be a 1.3, 1.4 steals guy, that'd be great. But he is really inflated by this huge run of getting steals over his last five games. Three steals, six steals, two steals, one steal, three steals, which has really elevated his numbers, pushing him right up the rankings and giving him that elevated value. Over the course of the year, he is 54th. I think that's a relatively... Oh, sorry, he is 37th. I think that's probably marginally too high again with those steal numbers. If they come back, he's probably around that 45 to 50 mark for the rest of the season. But it is a, a real strong run at the moment from the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray. Let's look at the next guy, another guard, Christian James McCollum of the Portland Trailblazers. He is ranked 69th over the season. Giggity. So I just had to uh, had to push that one. But lately, there's been some, uh, some jumps in his production. McCollum over the last two weeks is the 12th ranked player, averaging 25 points with four triples, five rebounds and five and a half assists with a steal a game and 1.1 blocks. So there are a few things there in what he's doing that seem unreal. 42% from three. Well, he can be a 40% three-point shooter. We've seen that before. But he's combining that with high two-point shooting. He's at just 43% from the field overall this season. So it's a significant jump up there. The usage has jumped up as well recently with the absences of of Damian Lillard and Hassan Whiteside for a little bit of time. And we're seeing him play 37 minutes a night. But most importantly, those five and a half assists per game, that's up from 3.9 over the year. He was at three last year. He was at 3.4 the year before that. He was at 3.6 the year before that. And prior to this little run, he really hadn't been getting assists. But recently, it's been strong. 7-3-5, 10-5-4 have been his assist totals over the last six games. 
He also had two games with multiple blocks in his last three. So six blocks across the last three games. He's also bumping his numbers up. And those usage numbers have been high without Lillard around. Now with Lillard and with Mallow there now, it's hard to see McCullum being able to maintain this level of production. Is the shooting fluky? Are the defensive numbers fluky? Are these high assists going to stick? I would say at least two of those things won't continue to happen, meaning he's not going to stick as a top 20 guy. I'd be more than happy to look at McCullum and get back a top 50, a top, probably get a top 40 guy back at this point because I don't think he finished the season. He finishes the season inside the top 50. DeMar DeRozan, the next one I want to talk about, a guy we hear lots of rumors about trades for DeRozan. If he does get traded, and the Spurs don't make in-season trades in general, but if he does get traded, it wouldn't be until after December 15th when at least half the league becomes more eligible to be traded. Um, that There is that, that talk that he deleted all of his stuff off his Instagram, the same thing that he did before he was traded in Toronto, so people are drawing conclusions from that. Um, I think that if, if he does get traded, and again, I, it, it probably is in their best interest. I think he is. Yeah, he can be quite damaging to development, developing their other players, and that's obviously not leading to wins. But that's another point. If he does get traded, his role is going to be lower because I don't think teams are going to be wanting DeMar DeRozan to be this number one focus of, of their team. Over the course of the year, he's the 44th ranked player. Over the last two weeks, he is 20th. I don't think he can be a top 40 guy for the rest of this season. The reason his numbers are so high is he is shooting an astonishing 57%. Actually, scratch that, 58% from two-point range. That is a crazy number. If we go back to his prior seasons, 49, 49, 48, 46. So to think that he's going to be a 58 guy, and he's at 54 over the course of the season, which is still an improvement. He is really on a run at the moment, averaging 25 and a half points, six boards and four assists. Of course, no defensive numbers. He's getting to the line, all that strong. But you drop that 58% shooting these there back to 50% shooting, and then he falls 30, 40 spots in the rankings, and that will uh, you know be able to enable you to execute that sell high if someone wants to buy in to what DeRozan is doing. Next player we look at, Marcus Smart of the Boston Celtics. A lot of this is injury-related, and with Kemba Walker returning today, some of the value from Smart immediately goes away. Now, I still think that Smart is a must-roster player if he's on your waiver wire. That, to me, is a no-brainer decision to go and see if you can find Marcus available there. But... Yeah, there can be guys that are must-add players, and they are also sell-high players. So if you've got them, you look to move on. Over the last two weeks, he's the 40th-ranked player. Over the last week, the 18th-ranked player. In that time, those last seven games, 14, 4, and 6 with two steals on 39 and 92. Look, those percentages are pretty stock standard, but the minutes are way up. 35 minutes a game with the absence of Gordon Hayward. We're seeing... Um, Usage go up to 19% during that time as well. The numbers are really strong. And again, he is a must-roster player. But he's if there's any way that you can do that deal... Now, remember, we're still probably two weeks away, two to three weeks away from Gordon Haywood returning. So you're not doing it right on the return of Haywood, which would make it impossible to do. So maybe you can sacrifice two weeks of top 40 production for Smart, get another top 50 guy back, and then Smart drops back to being a top 80 sort of a player after that. That's the idea. You don't want to be trying to do it right before that uh, day comes when Haywood's back because it's you're just not going to get that value back in a deal. Paul Millsap of the Denver Nuggets. And Millsap's performance on Tuesday wasn't great. The minutes were well down there. But prior to that, his numbers had been really strong. The 59th ranked player over the last two weeks, averaging 16 and 6 on really, really strong shooting percentages. In fact, the last time he shot this well was never. 53% from the field over the last six games, including 79% from the line and 47% from three. If Jeremy Grant continues to play like he did last game, which was really impressive, then I think Millsap will have his minutes reduced down as a preservation thing, not because he's playing poorly, but that efficiency that Millsap's showing at the moment and the minutes, both of those things could come back down and could very easily push him back outside the top 100. So getting any sort of top 80-ish type of guy for Millsap, I think would be a smart, uh, a, smart, a smart decision. The next player we look at, Spencer Dinwiddie of the Brooklyn Nets. Of course, Dinwiddie is putting up big numbers with Kyrie Irving sidelined at the moment. We don't know when Irving is going to be returning with his shoulder injury. It could, it, it's a tough one in terms of Dinwiddie, whether we sell high, because Irving could be back next week. He could be back in two months. Like, we just don't know with this injury. There is a significant risk there. Now, he is a must-roster player. He is 77th over the course of the season. Remember, though, he was nowhere near even the top 120 for the first two or three weeks of the year. Over the last two weeks, the 27th-ranked player. 
33 minutes, usage of 30%. All these things are absolutely through the roof. He had a usage of 25% last season, so that has gone absolutely sky high. He's averaging 24 and 6, a steal, a block, 42 and 93. So some really clear indicators of drop-offs coming. Only shooting 24% from three, 25% from three. Has never been a really strong uh, three-point shooter, but it's this usage, it's the minutes. We don't know the Kyrie return. So there is a, there's a definite element of risk here because he's a top 50, top 40 guy with Irving out. And then he probably falls to outside the top 100 when both Kyrie and Karras return. It is really, but yeah, it's a tough thing to do because if Kyrie then misses three months, then you are giving up so a, a strong player. So it really does depend who you give up in exchange for Dinwiddie. Um, but there are some indicators there that aren't going to be able to stick as we move forward. Evan Fournier of the Orlando Magic. He has been really, really strong uh, of late, putting up some big numbers. And of course, with the injury to Nikola Vucevic and Aaron Gordon, he's getting some extra run. He's the 49th ranked player over the last two weeks. He's 82nd over the course of the season, shooting 47% from the field, which would be a career high if it was able to stick. The 3.4 assists are also pretty strong. They're about the same as where he was last year. Realistically, what it's coming down to with what he's doing is really, really strong shooting numbers. 61 true shooting over the last two weeks with an increase in minutes and an increase in usage. Put all those things together and that pushes him into the top 50. When Vooch returns, the usage drops down. When Gordon returns, the usage drops down. And then he's going to have these waxes and wanes in his efficiency. He was at true shooting 54 last year. He's at 61 over the last six games, Yeah, meaning that there is some element of regression there. He's never had a season above 59 true shooting. That's not true, actually. 59.7 in his rookie year in Denver when he played 11 minutes a night. So there is some element of regression. A must-roster player, no doubt, like all of these guys pretty much are, apart from maybe the next player. Um, but there is uh, yeah, some indicators there that probably say that he's uh, not able to stick at this level. The last guy on the list is Larry Nance of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I bring him up mainly because people have mentioned this to me and they look at his recent production. The guy is balling at the moment. Over the last four weeks, averaging four, sorry, four games, averaging 14 and eight, two assists, one steal, 30 minutes. The minutes are there. Yes, they are. Because in those four games, Kevin Love missed two of them and then Tristan Thompson missed another one. So Nance started and played big minutes. 35 minutes in a start when Thompson was out. Great. Thompson and Love played 21 minutes. Eesh. Love out, 32 minutes. Love out, 34 minutes. Big numbers. It's all a matter of minutes. Now, it might be hard to execute a sell high. He's worth grabbing in case the Kevin Love injury rolls on and we get more missed games because we can see he's going to put up numbers in those situations. But what we have to be weary of is that, you know, can you get something back? Can you get a top 70 guy back, a top 60 guy back, a top 80 guy back? Because if Love and Thompson play, there's no value in Nance. We've seen that multiple times this season. If one of them's out, then through the roof he goes. So it is a bit of a balancing act, much like the Spencer Dinwiddie situation. But if people are throwing that out there, hey, look at those last four games. Without investigating context, you might be able to swindle them in a deal by sending Nance away and uh, with the expe expectation that it's been figured out by uh, John Beeline that he's got to play 30 minutes a night when that just hasn't been the case at this point. There have been extenuating circumstances which has led him to that playing time. That'll do it for today's show. Of course, these aren't all of the sell high guys. You might have some other options there. Tweet at me or leave it in the comments below. Subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.